thankful for the word this morning? Are, are, really, are you thankful for the word this morning? The word of the Lord for the people of the Lord. I, I think we can do that a little better. There's an affirmation there that we, the people of the Lord, are thankful for this book. It's not just an Amazon.com bestseller. It is the living, breathing, transforming Word of God. Amen? Amen? Let's try that one more time. The Word of the Lord for the people of the Lord. Amen. Thanks be to God. Well, I want to ask you this question. As we get started this morning, as we encounter this transforming Word, uh, and maybe answer a few questions along the way. There's something in your bulletin, I had Pastor Nicole change this morning, that I'm really hoping you notice. Did anybody notice something kind of odd? What might you have noticed? It's not, it's not the front cover. John Ryan knows, he looks like Arnold Horshack from the Welcome Back on the Oh, Pastor Ryan. Tell us what it is, John Ryan. Yeah, it doesn't say order of worship. It says the baptism of our Lord Sunday. Now, I want to talk to you for a moment about that this morning. Because you see, Christians all over the world are celebrating the baptism of our Lord Jesus Christ today. And you see this reflected in our sanctuary today. I've talked to you a couple of weeks back about some of the colors you see the green and the purple and the red and the white. The white, and by the way, did you notice the switch on Christmas Sunday? The color from the purple of Advent to the white because Christ has come among us. You see, the color white is the symbol of purity and the royalty of Jesus Christ. Our, our pulpit uh, pyramids today are trimmed in gold, which is the symbol of his royalty. And there's a reminder that happens as we look at things. You say, well, I've never celebrated the baptism of our Lord Sunday before. Well, I'm sorry for that. And I confess to you that I'm coming to some of this liturgical understanding later in life myself. And I'm finding that it creates a lot of meaning for me. And I'm hoping and praying that as we practice it, it will create meaning for you too. Because... You see, the colors and the symbols and the celebration say something powerful about who we are. And I'm going to get there in just a minute. But some this morning might be agitated by the presence of our Christmas tree uh, here in the sanctuary on the 13th of January. After all, your Christmas trees were probably down long ago. I will make a confession, mine is not. All right? But if you remember, the white and gold on the Christmas tree are reminding us first of the purity and royalty and holiness of the Savior, of His coming among us to make us a people who are pure and holy like Him. But I will also say to you that just because the world finished celebrating Christmas, 24 hours at most after that day, the church doesn't. The church says Christmas is more than a, a, a retailer's dream. Christmas and the celebration of the coming Christ is something more powerful to who we are. Something more central to the core of our being. You see... As we gather in this room on this day, flying in the face of the world by saying, yes, we still have our Christmas tree up, and yes, the colors in our sanctuary are still white with the celebration of Christmas as we celebrate the baptism of our Lord, we are recognizing that as the gathered body of Christ, we have a different way of reckoning time. Time is the fundamental way that we orient our, orient our life. I used to carry a daytimer with me. I, I could never
never carry that little pocket size, and I had to carry the big notebook size one. You know, because I needed all my contacts in there, and I had to break my day down, and you know, I had to organize that thing so that I don't do that anymore. But maybe it's more so because I carry this thing now, and if I were to flip back a few pages and hit a few buttons, you'd find my calendar and see how the week's all laid out already, and I keep adding things to that. But that's a worldly way of reckoning time. You see, our world deems time as a category of wealth that we make a decision how we're going to spend. Time is that thing that we prioritize. Oh, and by the way, I would say to you that there is no clearer definition of your values than how you spend your time. There is no clearer definition of who you are at the root and seed of your being than how we spend our time. But I don't want to talk to you this morning and call your attention to a worldly way of reckoning time. Because as Christians, the way we reckon, reckon time is fundamentally different than how the world reckons time. We understand something central to life, that we are not the owners of all time. I think there's some collars that just got a little bit tight this morning and maybe just a little sweat popped out on the bead of your brow. No. We are not the owners of our time because as followers of Jesus Christ, He is Lord of our time. I'm betting that statement may unsettle a few this morning. Good, I hope it does. Because we need to be unsettled. All too often, all too easily, as people who live, quote, as disciples of Jesus Christ, we are forced into its mold. And we define who we are by our productivity. We define who we are by how many hours we, quote, spend at work. Yes, and we categorize and segregate our time into various compartments such as home, work, play, rest, family, and maybe church, God. How many times have we heard somebody say, well, this is me time, or this is family time, or... And often our understanding is that if we give God one hour of our Sunday, okay, 90 minutes. I know, I preach long. I told my preaching students that this week. As long as I give God 90 minutes on Sunday, I have fulfilled my obligation and punched my ticket to heaven. And we absolutely, positively miss the drive of the kingdom and who we are in Christ. You see, Christians mark time differently than the world does. We understand that the one who set the second hand of time ticking into the ages, moving inexorably to the day when he comes again, that one owns time. We are merely stewards over the time he grants us. He is Lord over the seconds, the minutes, the hours, the days, the weeks, the months, years, Decades, centuries, and millennia over time. So when we gather in worship to celebrate the baptism of our Lord Sunday, while Walmart is all decked out for Valentine's Day already, we are recognizing that as followers of Jesus Christ, we live a holy calling to swim counter to the grain of culture and reckon our time differently than does the world. Because after all, our identity is not in the world. But it is in the kingdom of God. And I need to tell you, I'm really revved up about this subject because I have literally spent the last eight days of my life focusing on Luke 3 and 4 and another passage.
passage considering who we are in Christ Jesus. Uh, on Tuesday evening and Wednesday morning, I talked to a group of about 35 pastors, my colleagues, about who we are in Christ and defining our identity in Christ Jesus rather than the world. And I have to tell you, God's been doing some rather uncomfortable work in my own heart as he has reminded me and brought me to these passages in Luke. Part of me wants to start here and preach through the whole fourth chapter. And if that makes you a little nervous, it should. Because I can preach hours from that passage. But I want to focus on this one this morning as we consider how we reckon time. Because you see, in the church, as disciples of Jesus Christ, our year doesn't begin with singing Auld Lang Syne and toasting one another while the ball drops in New York City. Our, our, our Christian time doesn't begin because the pages of a calendar flipped over to January 2013. Our year is oriented by a different force. Because you see, our year began with the purple of Advent and the preparation of his coming again. This year, here at MCN, lamenting the fact that although he's coming again, we're not ready. And we are to be living out his kingdom. That's where our year began. And then it, we moved through the, the, the purple of Advent to the white of Christmas. Wonderful candlelight celebration reminding us of the coming of the light and our responsibility to be the light and spread the light. And then celebrating Epiphany Sunday last week as we celebrated his appearance to the wise men. Culminating today with the baptism of our Lord Sunday. And yes, next Sunday you will notice the colors flip to green. Because we enter that season after Christmas that, that lead us through to the purples of Advent. That time of the year we call ordinary time. Well, not because time's ordinary, it's not. The one who owns the time makes every day we spend a miracle of the gift of God. But it's ordinary in the fact we're not celebrating a party. Other than the party of Jesus Christ coming in our life to bring hope to the world. And the green of ordinary time reminds us that we reckon time differently. Or we should, if we say I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. Because the Lord of the universe is Lord over time as well. The colors, the seasons, the celebration reminds us of whose we are, why we're here, and what really matters. What really matters. And you see, in Luke's Gospel, the story of Jesus' baptism is one of those watershed moments. <laughs> It's one of those seminal moments in the story as Luke recounts this history of Jesus Christ, the salvation of the world. Interestingly, as I read this passage and thought about it this week, the actual baptism takes up a very narrow sliver of Luke's gospel. And that's in very decided contrast to Matthew, Mark, and John, who have lengthier <coughs> accounts of the baptism of Jesus Christ. Uh, if you are a student of such things and you study this passage, as you begin in verse 17, you'll notice this reference to John, who is pointing to Jesus Christ and reminding that even though he's baptizing with the water of repentance, the one who's coming will bring uh, the baptism with fire, which is the purity, the white reminds us of. And he comes, and there's this judgment passage. He comes with his winnowing fork in his hand. Now, in this modern and mechanized age, we might not really identify with winnowing forks. You hear winnowing fork and you think pitchfork. Uh, and honestly, the only thing I ever used a pitchfork for was to either spread hay to feed the cow or to shovel off the um, remains of the hay. 
And that's not a winnowing fork. In, in biblical, we have threshing machines today, and these huge combines that do the work of winnowing. And what happened is, in those days, they, they gathered the wheat together in a pile. They didn't have machines to separate the grain from the stalk. So they, they had these great forks. And after the grain had ripened and they cut it, they would take it and they would shake it and throw it up into the air. And, and the chaff, the straw, the hay, the things would settle back to earth and the grain would fly over in another pile. And, and the fruit of the grain would gather together while the waste, the animal bedding, the fuel for their homes left aside to be burnt. Now understand, when you see those kinds of phrases in Scripture, they should give us pause to stop and think. And I have to tell you, it's eerily reminiscent of what I deem to be one of the scariest passages in Scripture. Where Jesus looks at the disciples, those gathered around him, and says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. And parables like the wheat and the tares, and the sheep and the goats, where Jesus challenges the disciples, don't worry about the bad seed in you, because the Lord will take care of that at the end of time. See, that's a judgment passage that should give us pause as we consider time and purpose and identity to say, if the Lord were to come right now and separate the good from the bad, where would we settle out in all of this? Then you have John in prison, actually in the interlude between the, these two passages, Pastor Paul read this morning. Then you have Jesus being baptized. Boom, boom, it's done. And we find him standing uh, somewhere, we don't even know the Jordan River from Luke's Gospel, praying. And the Holy Spirit falls. The voice from heaven said, this is my beloved son, in whom I'm well pleased. And the narrative continues on. And you might ask the question, why is this so significant for Luke? Because this passage begins a series of identity issues for Jesus Christ. In, in, in immediately following this passage, if you look, flip over in your gospel to Luke chapter 4, after the baptism, you find the genealogy that reminds us the earthly history of Jesus. But then you come immediately to the temptation story, uh, where the devil takes him out in the wilderness and tempts Christ. Uh, Jesus heals, uh, actually back up there, flip too far, uh, you find Jesus rejected in his home, own hometown uh, because of his identity. The, the temptation of the evil one come at the point of identity, trying to get Jesus to, to fulfill his mission, but short circuit the journey to the cross, which is an identity issue. This becomes a defining moment for Jesus Christ and becomes definitive for us as well if we would claim to be followers of Jesus Christ. So let's explore this very briefly this morning. There's three things you need to see in the scripture. There's three movements for John, the fir or for Luke. The first, the first is the heavens are open. Now think on that for a minute. The heavens are open. Can you picture yourself standing there alongside the river with those gathered who were baptized that day? And this guy who has a great reputation among the people because his authority, his power is beginning to be made known. As he stands there and is praying. Please, by the way, this is an aside. I'm going to talk about it in a minute. It is an aside. Do not miss this simple phrase that you fly by on the way to, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. It says very simply, as Jesus was praying. Bookmark that, because we desperately need to consider that. But as Jesus was praying, the heavens are open. There is the revelation of the presence of God. You see the visible form. 
the, the skies literally opened up and the glory of God shines down, falls down in, in the bodily person of this dove settling on Jesus Christ. And this voice from heaven comes down and said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. The heavens are open. It reveals the mystery of the salvation that God proclaimed so many years ago was right here, right now. Those who witnessed it would be immediately reminded of the prophecies. For instance, in Isaiah that Pastor Butch read this morning, that reminds us that salvation comes bringing deliverance, bringing wholeness, bringing comfort, bringing the day of jubilee to pass as God intended. And by the heavens being open, there is this symbolic expression that this work of God is right here, right now. The kingdom of God has come. Luke is stating in no uncertain terms for all who would hear, the mystery of salvation has been made plain, and it is the person of Jesus Christ. Baptized into death in this world, that we might be baptized into life in the world to come. The opening of heaven. But then we find the dove settling. The Holy Spirit comes on Jesus. Now I have to tell you, as I teach theology, as we consider the doctrine of the Trinity, which is you know, right here in this passage is one of those times in Scripture you have all three people of our Trinity mentioned. God the Father in heaven, this is my beloved Son. You have the Son in the person of the baptized Christ and the Holy Spirit settling in, as the dove upon the earthly Christ. That's a mystery to me. Now how is it that one God is all of these places in all of these ways? I don't know. But here it is. And something powerful is being said as Jesus is being initiated into this earthly ministry as the Messiah, the suffering Savior, as the Holy Spirit comes down from heaven as a dove and settles on him. Because remember, this baptized Christ, yes, we very quickly say, oh, he was very God and very God, and we would well do that because that's in all of our creeds. We are radical monotheists. That's what scripture tells us. We have one God. But let's not forget. The miracle and the mystery of the incarnation is the baptized Christ standing on the banks of the river is 100% human. Which means we have a savior borrowed from the book of Hebrews who is tempted in every way even as we are yet without sin. We have one who descended into Hades, knowing the pain and the suffering of death, to be raised again on the third day, experiencing victory over death. But, do not forget, for 33 years, this sanctified, holy, blessed Savior
That's what it's all about. Every single time. That's our identity, folks, by the way. Even as Jesus is discovering his identity as Messiah in this passage and the one to come, the Holy Spirit settles to empower ministry, to empower the witness to go out. Jesus embraces that. Jesus draws his identity from the purpose. And I want you to flip over to Luke chapter 4. I have to read this passage. Just 17 verses into chapter 4, you find Jesus in Nazareth. He is in the synagogue as was his custom. Okay? Now picture that. God of the universe, eternal, before there was, he was. After there is, he will be. The God of the universe getting up every day to go with the men of the community to the synagogue to hear the word. I'm going to let you take that where you need to take it. All right. Jesus gathers there. On this particular day, he picks up the scrolls, he's handed the scrolls, and he, he begins to teach. And he reads this passage from Isaiah chapter 61. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. Remember the anointing of the Holy Spirit is baptism just a chapter early. He has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives, recovering of the sight to the blind, and to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then to the horror of the scribes gathered there, he rolled up the scrolls, he handed it back, and he said, Today, this passage, Today, this prophecy has been fulfilled in your hearing. Claiming this identity as Messiah. Rather than their powerful military, throw off the Roman oppression emperor, views of Messiah. You see, Jesus is being taken into this ministry as the proclaimer of the word of salvation. The one who makes everything right. Who brings to pass the year of Jubilee. And when you consider that identity, the power of the Holy Spirit is mandatory. And he draws that purpose which enables him when they clamor in on him and you know, when people are coming to him. And this always amazes me about Jesus. And the ministry really gets rolling. And people are saying, oh, we need you, Jesus. We need you, Jesus. He says to his disciples, ah, it's going so well here. Let's, uh, let's go to another place, a solitary place to pray. So we can hear from our God. Or, or, or he gets up and he says, that's not my deal. I've come to proclaim the good news to the poor, make blind and out of sea, and proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. His identity is Savior. Then this voice, the third movement is, announces, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. It calls to mind for me, Images of Moses at the burning bush. You remember that story? Moses is there and God gives him this mission to bring the people up out of Egypt. To be their deliverer. To be the Messiah for the people of Israel. And Moses says what many of us would say. Hey, uh, I need a sign, Lord. Now, I'm not really sure this is from you. you know, maybe I had a little too much sage for supper last night. You know, the indigestion's hit me kind of hard. I really need a sign. And the voice of God says, Moses, I'm going to give you a sign. When you bring my people out and you worship me on this holy mountain, you will know that I, the Lord, have sent you. This passage kind of reminds me of that. Because the whole of Jesus' teaching, the cross is ahead of him. But yet, here is this testimony from God above. This is my beloved son. In him I am well pleased because he is and 
will be the Messiah. So you might say, Pastor Art, that's all great and good. What's that have to do with me? What's that have to do with this reckoning time thing? What's the point? I'm really glad you asked me. Because you know I'm about to tell you. We're the Church of Jesus Christ. Four amens, maybe. We're the Church of Jesus Christ, warts and all. Amen? Okay, we're up to about a dozen. We're the church of Jesus Christ. We claim to be followers of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen? That means we draw our identity, our mission, our purpose from Him. You might not want to say amen very quickly. Because remember what his identity, his purpose, and his mission cost him. We cannot forget that. Our identity as followers of Jesus Christ is to be the broken Christ in the world today. To live out, Jesus quote on Isaiah 61. To live out as the message of hope. To pour our lives out as a sacrifice that the world might know him through us. That defines who we are. And to be anything less means that we have no part of Him. You remember the winnowing fork? <clears throat> See, that's the hard word to come out of this passage. You've heard it said, old timers, I know you've heard this. He's either Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. We're either all in his purpose, his mission, his identity, or we're not in. So as we reckon time, as we begin this brand new year, there's a, a fundamental question that we must answer for ourselves. Are we, will we be truly 